In this MATLAB session, we are going to implement the secant method to find the root of, in this case, the sine function. Yes, we all know what the roots are of the sine function, but let's pretend that we don't for this example. So we'll name this demo secant method, and I've already saved it. The first thing I like to do is initialize MATLAB. And I will close all the figure windows. I will clear the command window and I will clear all the variables from memory, the most important one being that last step. At this point, I want to set up my dashboard. This is all of the hard-coded numbers in the program. We're not going to perform any work here, and the idea is that we can control everything about our program just through this dashboard and not have to dive into the code to change anything. So I like to make big, dramatic text here to, to separate my sections of code. It just helps me. Okay, so the first thing we'll need in our dashboard is the function that we're finding the root of. And I'm going to use something called a handle or a pointer. And func will become a pointer to the sine function. And the reason I'm doing this is we're going to have to call the sine function many times in our algorithm. But if I wanted then to find the root of a cosine function or a tangent function or something else, if I didn't do this, I'd have to go find reference to sine in, in all the different lines of my code and change it to cosine or tan. And that can be rather cumbersome. And I might miss one and make a mistake. This way, I just define the sine function up front and for the rest of the code, I can use func as the sine function. So let's go ahead and run this. So I can type in sine of 0 0.1 or func of 0 0.1. Func now acts exactly like sine. So in addition to the code that I'm writing, also watch the manner that I write this code. I'm always writing a few lines, testing a few lines, writing a few lines, testing a few lines. And that's the best way to do it. You never want to write the entire program, and when you're finished, hit run for the very first time. It becomes much more difficult to find your mistakes. Next thing we'll need in our dashboard, if you recall from the secant method, hopefully you watched the lecture videos so you have the theoretical basis for the secant method. But we need two initial guesses as to where the root is. We'll define these as x1 and x2, and let's pretend we don't know the root of sine. We just know it's somewhere in the three and a half ish, four ish kinds of range. So we'll let x1 be 3.9, and x2 be, I will let that be 3.9, and the other one 4.0. The only other thing we'll need in the dashboard to control our function is the tolerance. We will iterate, we will iteratively improve our solution, and the tolerance will tell the program to stop when the changes in our answer are small enough. So let's set it 10 to the minus 6. And we'll go ahead and run that, just make sure we don't get any errors. Okay, all is good. On to the next section of code. And we'll change this to implement secant method. So the first step in the secant method is to evaluate the function at point one. We'll call it f1 func x1. Now the reason we do this, if we didn't, if we didn't say f1 equals func of x1, and just in our code constantly referred to func of x1 and constantly evaluating that, imagine for example every call to func would take three days to calculate. This way we just save that answer in f1, and every time we need it. We just call f1 and don't call func of x1 each time. So it'll make the code run faster when those calculations are slow. Now in this case, the calculation is almost instantaneous to us and you won't see any difference here.
But if funk were slow, this is definitely the best way to do it. At this point, we want to enter into the main loop. And I will use a while loop and while something. So in the Segan method, we have this dx. It's how much we've changed our x. So I might look at the absolute value of those changes. And when those changes, or while those changes are greater than our tolerance, we will do the stuff inside of our while loop. Well, one thing now, we enter our while loop. We need dx. We haven't defined it. dx is something we calculate inside the loop every time we change x. We look at how far it moved. So just to make sure that our while loop runs that first time, we can set dx to infinity. That way it'll work for any tolerance that we might enter in. Another thing we might like to do is count how many iterations this took. So let's define iter and set it to zero. And then at the very beginning, we can count our iteration simply by adding one to that. Now let's set dx to zero. That's just a little trick to make sure that the while loop ends. If we run it, yes, it ends. And our iter count should be just one. The next thing we need to do is calculate the function at point x2. Let's say evaluate. So we'll say f2 is func of x2. And we'll use f2 if we need it again in place of func2 so we're not constantly evaluating func at x2 each time. Now, uh, I'm not going to derive this equation, but the next step is to calculate this change in x to tell us how far away our new value of x is. And I'm borrowing this equation straight from the notes. But let's quickly remember what actually happened here. We have two points, x1 and x2. We evaluated the function. We fit that to a line. And we projected the line down to the x-axis to see where that would cross. And that's our next guess of where the root might be. And dx is how much we have to change x, uh, or how far away it is from x2 to our new point where we think the root might be, or we hope. Let's go ahead and run this. Let's leave the semicolon off so we can see what value we calculated. And I can't tell if that's right or wrong. What I'm looking for at this point, is that a, an NAN or an infinity, or something that tells us we've done our calculation incorrectly. But it seems like a reasonable number to me. So we move on to the next step. And at this point, we've calculated a third point. So we would like to make the new first point our old second point. Now this is one of the reasons why we calculated F1 and F2 rather than keep calling funk. If I didn't do that, I would have had to call func at x2 and actually do that evaluation twice. Remember, pretend each call to func would take three days, and this we wouldn't have to call it again. We're just reusing the number we've already calculated. Now we're going to update the position of the second point. And essentially, this is moving the second point to where we just projected down onto the x-axis from the, from the fitting to a line. And we'll go ahead and run this, make sure we're getting a reasonable value for x2. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it does look wrong. It's not an NAN, it's not an infinity or something like that. At this point, we hope the algorithm is correct. And we'll know soon because if we run it and it freezes up on us, then something's obviously wrong. So let's go ahead and run it. And hey, it finished almost instantaneously to us. 
Let's see what the root is, and really our, the best guess at the root comes out being x2. We'll type in x2, and look, that is pi. Sine of pi is zero. We knew that ahead of time, but we pretended that we didn't know about that. So that is the secant method. I hope this helps.